Okay, so uh, let's take a look at existence of equilibria to make sure that uh, they, they are around when we want to analyze a game. So existence is a very important property. Why is it an important property? Because if we don't have any equilibrium, then it's very difficult to make predictions about what's going to happen in a game. Whereas if we do have equilibria, then at least we can make some predictions about what might happen in a game. So the existence of equilibrium is uh, an important uh, question. And so one note is that every game we've really looked at so far in the course has had an equilibrium. And we might ask, is this a general property? Is this something that's true in a lot of cases or in, in cases of interest? And one of the most important theorems on this is a theorem by, by John Nash in 1950. And what he proved was that in every game where each player has a finite number of pure actions or pure strategies, so similar to many of the examples we've considered so far, there exists at least one equilibrium. Uh, and possibly it, it might involve mixed strategies, so it might be that the only equilibria are in mixed strategies, but every game that has a finite number of pure strategies has at least one equilibrium, one Nash equilibrium, possibly in mixed strategies. So this is the, the theorem that gave the name Nash equilibrium, uh, the existence here. And in order to get a feeling for how this works, so we're not going to go through a formal proof of this, um, the, the proof of this theorem involves uh, using fixed point theorems, um, which we're not necessarily going to assume that you know, but uh, we can give you an idea of, of why this holds and what the sort of logic behind the proof is, and then uh, you can uh, look at, at some of the references in the syllabus for uh, background and uh, in particular for, for people who are interested in, in knowing a little more about existence. So why might this be true? So let's, let's have a look, at, start by in two by two games and understanding what's happening in the two by two games and then um, the principles behind this are, are a generalization but the, the logic can be seen in this case. So let's imagine that we have uh, a situation where we keep track of the, say the row player has a choice between up and down, the column player has a choice between left and right, we keep track of, say, the, you know, the role player's payoffs, A, B, C, D, for, for these various entries. The column player has corresponding uh, payoffs. So if we're keeping track of the probability that the column player plays right, for instance, so let's say the probability that the column player plays right, we keep track of that, then we can keep track of what the payoff to up is. It's going to be... Um, 1 minus p times a plus p times b, that's the payoff to playing up. And the payoff to playing down, correspondingly, if we look back here, c if they're playing left, d if they're playing right, we're keeping track of that probability, then we end up with um, 1 minus p, p is this probability of playing right by the uh, column player on c, plus p on d, so we get you know, two curves again, just like we had before. And uh, again, in this case, we get um, you know, a situation where up is better, a situation where down is better, uh, an intersection. Now, it could be you know, that uh, in, in this game, so in this game, we, we end up with these three situations. It could be that, that one of these curves is uh, above the other one entirely, so you always want to play up or you always want to play down. Um, but the important thing to note is that when we draw these out, we get a nice connected best response correspondence. So for each probability that we list for what the column player is doing, we have a choice of either up is better or down is better or you're completely indifferent. And what that means is as we trace out what's going to happen, we're going to end up with a nice graph where as we march from the left to the right, I can draw this in a way where my pen does not leave the paper. So I, I, I move along, maybe I'm indifferent for a while, so any points where I'm going to switch between up and down, I'm going to be indifferent at exactly those points, and then I go in one direction or another. So when we look at, at mapping out these correspondences, you know, we end up with a nice connected graph in terms of the best response correspondence of the row player, 
we do a similar analysis for the, the column player. And the idea here is that, that these curves, if I'm going to try and draw these, they must cross somewhere. So in terms of the row player, I'm marching along. Uh, if I'm moving from, from left to right, my pen doesn't leave the paper. I'm going from, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. For the column player, I'm going from the bottom here up to the top, and my pen doesn't leave the paper again. If my pen doesn't leave the paper, and uh, I, I'm going, one curve is going from the bottom of this graph to the top from this picture, Right, so I start with uh, zero on this axis and move upwards. The other curve goes from left to right, and it doesn't leave the paper. Um, connected continuous curves have to cross somewhere. So generally, uh, what we need is just a point where both are on their best response correspondences. Uh, generally, there's a theorem that would tell us that if, as long as these curves are connected, we're going to have to have an intersection. The general version of that theorem says that if the best response correspondences are nicely behaved in terms of having this connected uh, structure and we're working in a nice space, then they're going to, there's going to be a point where we're on everybody's best response correspondence at the same point at the same time. So uh, we end up with then with a nice conclusion that there always exists at least one equilibrium. It might be mixed, it might be pure, but there's always at least one. There could be more, but there's always at least one. Okay, so we have a nice existence result. Um, Nash equilibria always exist when we have a finite set of pure strategies. Um, do they always exist more generally? So sometimes, as we saw before in the course, it's nice to uh, look at games where players might have an infinite number of strategies, not just a finite set. And uh, unfortunately, equilibria don't always exist without some additional assumptions. So just to give one feeling for that, let's look at a very simple game that doesn't have a, a Nash equilibrium. Um, let's uh, think of, of a set of players, and each player gets to name an integer. Okay, So each player yells out an integer, and whoever yells out the highest integer wins a prize. So you get a payoff of one, say, if you are the person announcing the highest integer, a uh, payoff of zero if somebody else announces the highest integer. Uh, let's flip a coin in the case where there's a tie. So if there's, uh, uh, say, two players that tie, um, we'll flip a coin to dis decide who wins. So in that situation, well, you'd always like to be naming a number that's higher than anybody else's number. So whatever number one player announces, somebody else would like to announce a higher number. It's pretty easy to see that there's no equilibrium point. Whatever number, whoever's winning, um, the other player should, should change the strategy that they're announcing. So if one player announces 100 and the other announces 50, then the player who announced 50 should announce something bigger than 100. But if they announce something bigger than 100, then the other player should announce something even bigger. So we end up with no equilibrium in, in this game. So the question of existence of, of equilibria and Nash uh, existence of Nash equilibria is a, an active area of research. Um, there are many different theorems for games with infinite strategy spaces and depending on the structure the you need to put more structure on the game in order to say whether there does or does not exist equilibria um, but the, there are there's a, a quite a bit of research that's been done on that and uh, nicely behaved games tend to have equilibria but what nightly, nicely behaved is, is a, a question for, for beyond uh, our investigations here. Okay, so what we've done in terms of looking at Nash equilibria, we've gone through pure strategy Nash equilibria, understanding what they look like. Um, we've talked a little bit about mi mixed strategy Nash equilibria. Um, generally, in, in games, there can exist multiple equilibria. In games with finite strategy spaces, there always exists at least one. So we have some predictions of stable points. And the nice part about Nash equilibria is if you are there, if we all uh, anticipate that those are the strategies that are going to be played, then nobody has a reason to move away from that. So these are stable points. They're the points uh, where we can make predictions that are going to be self-fulfilling. So they have very nice properties in terms of making predictions about outcomes of games. 